series, what we believe. We believe, and the Bible says, that you must be born again. How many of you know there is only one way to get to heaven? Amen. And who is that way? Jesus. Jesus. There is no other way for men to be saved than through Jesus. There are a lot of other religions, but there's only one Savior, and that's Jesus Christ. And without a personal, ongoing relationship with Him, there is no possible way to spend eternity in heaven. And this morning, we're going to take a look at what Jesus had to say, what the Word has to say about the fact that you must be born again. If you'll turn with me in your Bibles to the book of John, chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, and this is the lead-up to the, the quintessential, I guess, Scripture verse on salvation that everyone learns as a child. You learn growing up. You memorize it. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And this morning, we are going to, we're going to take a look at what took place as the, the scriptures were heading that direction, as Jesus was getting ready to make that proclamation. John chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, it says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night. I think it's interesting. All the opportunities that Jesus you ever, you ever wonder why someone would come to Jesus by night instead of by day when everybody could see him? Came to him by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you come from God as a teacher. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And verse 1 again says that Nicodemus was what? He was a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee, and he comes to Jesus and calls him rabbi or teacher, says, we know you've come from God. He says, no, because no one can do the things that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, and this is important, he says, truly, truly. How many of you know if Jesus repeats himself, there must be something there? Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Bottom line, unless someone is born again, the title of the message is you must be born again. And listen to me, those people that you work with, they must be born again in order to make it to heaven. Amen. Those family members that you love so dearly, they must be born again in order for them to go to heaven. Those friends and neighbors that you enjoy spending time with, they must be born again in order to go to heaven. And if we are holding so great a treasure within us, and the Bible says that we are earthen vessels with a treasure that's been placed inside of us. You know what that treasure is? That is the hope of salvation. That is eternity. That is the word of God. That is Jesus Christ. Amen. And if we are earthen vessels, these clay pots, as it were, that hold so great a treasure, and we hold that in and we don't let people know, then what sort of people are we? Amen. Verse 3 again, Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now you can understand Nicodemus was confused here. It says, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? That's an important statement that we're going to come back to. Once you are born, once you are in that state of being born, you cannot go back to where you were. Verse 5, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say unto you, 
unless one is born of water. And how many, how many of you have ever been around when a woman says, my water broke? That's <laughs> ironic. <laughs> That's <laughs> born of water. I remember when when Tish was pregnant with Stephen. She had, we had, with with Rachel. She was in labor for 23 hours. She I, I, with Rachel. She said, "I think it's time." And you know, young guy. Whoo, whoo, we, I loaded up. I grabbed her. We ran. I mean, I got her to the hospital. I was and got in there, and then we sat for 23 hours. And then something incredible happened. Rachel was born. Six years later, she's pregnant with Stephen. I'm watching a football game. Finished my sandwich and got chip and dip. Lawson's chip and dip? Oh. Oh. <laughs> they still have it at Circle K. It's primo stuff. I'm eating my chip and dip. And Tish says, when you get finished there, I think we need to head for the hospital. I'm thinking... 23 hours, I can finish my dip. <laughs> yeah. And I'm eating my dip, and Tish is getting fidgety, and I'm watching the game, it's a good game, and all of a sudden she says, oh! and she jumps up and runs. And I'm thinking, what's that about? <laughs> <laughs> and she hollers from the bathroom, my water broke. Oh. It was about 22 and a half hours until the water broke, and then, oh! <laughs> Needless to say, and we lived, we lived three blocks from the hospital. We get to the hospital, walk in, and I'm, if you're one that films the birth, don't show me. I don't want to see it. <laughs> Keep that to yourself. We always film before and then after. And we get inside, and the nurse is talking to Tish, and she's getting information, and she's kind of frantic, and I thought, well, that's kind of odd, and I'm Joe Casual. I said, I forgot the camera that we borrowed for this. I need to go out to the car. And she says, you don't have time for a camera. And I said, oh. And a half an hour after we walked in the hospital, I was holding him. When that water broke, it was a sign. Listen to me, fellas, if you haven't been there yet, when they said my water is broken, look, Dan, what do you do? Run. Run! And unless you're born of water, which is what takes place in the physical birth, and born of the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God, obviously. Unless you are physically born, and by the way, those aborted babies that are in the womb are in water, and when they are aborted, they're still alive. And at that point, the Bible tells us, and I've, I, I got into this, I had someone challenge me on this, but the Bible says that you only have an angel if you're going to heaven. The Bible just expressly tells us that when you are destined for heaven, when you have Jesus Christ and his blood and his grace and his mercy covering, covering you, you have an angel. And the Bible also talks about the little ones. It says their angels go to and from. And so those that haven't come to a point of being able to make a decision, they're covered by the grace of God. And they are born, even if they're aborted, they are still in God's eyes being born. They were born the moment they were conceived. And they are born of the flesh, and they are born of the spirit. And we need to understand, unless you are born of water and the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born only of flesh, is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit of God is Spirit. Father, this morning, I pray as you move among your people, as you are in this place right now, that we would drop all of our pretenses, that we would put away all our preconceived ideas of what it is to have church and what it is to, to be a part of the body of Christ. I pray that you would make us into clean slates that you can write on. Lord, that your kingdom would come into this place and that your will would be done today. Yes. Perfectly and completely. That is my prayer, Father, in Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. Now we have here as what I've read this morning, John chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. This is the introduction to that most famous quote, that most famous scripture that is used for people understanding salvation, that being what we said already, John 3, 16, for God loved the world so much that he was willing to give his one and only son for us. That whoever, and how many of you are glad for that term, whoever, yeah, I've mentioned it before in messages. I, I get tired of it. I had a guy that he used to aggravate me. He'd do the dumbest stuff, and I'd call him on it. He'd say, whatever. I just want whatever. I'm right upset. <laughs> but this isn't, we're talking right here. Whoever, whoever, if I was to, if I was to put a $100 bill, which I don't have, by the way, on this table, and said, whoever comes up here and picks it up, they get it. How many of you would say, I'm a whoever? Amen. Lord, I felt that too. Yeah. <laughs> whoever applies to us. And as we, as we look at this, this scripture, that whoever believes in him. What does it mean? It's, it's more than, you know, I, I believe that, that there's electricity in the light switches. But unless I turn them on, it doesn't do me a bit of good. You know, I, I believe that I believe that my truck is going to start today. Sometimes I have to have faith for that. But unless I put the key in and turn it on, put it in gear, and drive it, my belief in that truck being there does me no good whatsoever. And listen to me this morning. Believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He came to earth, He died for our sins, He rose again, and He's preparing a place for us in heaven. If we truly believe that, we're going to drive that rascal. We're going we're to put the key in and start it up, we're going to put it in gear, and we're going to drive it, we're going to live that life. That whoever believes, truly believes, I've mentioned it before, they're, they were translating the Bible into a different language, and they got to John 3.16, and they couldn't find a word that accurately, in that language that they were translating to, that accurately described what it was to believe. And they finally came up with a word that basically said, if you put your whole weight upon it. When you put your whole weight upon it. How many of you ever walked out on ice and you weren't sure? You know, by the time you get your full weight on it, when, when, you, yeah, <laughs> when you're in the shallow part, that's where you do your, your jump. And, you, and, and once you recognize this is solid, then you put your full weight on it and walk out on it. And if we really believe that whoever truly, really, from the bottom of their heart, believe, they will be born again. Now, as we look at the gospel, it talks about, first of all, God's love for sinful man. Aren't you glad that God loved you from the very beginning? Amen. God loved you before you even knew what love was. God love, God's love for sinful man. By the way, when God spoke to Adam, he wasn't speaking to protoplasm or Neanderthal man. He was speaking to man made in his image. Yes, amen. And second of all, we need to grab a hold of the fact that the greatest gift ever given to mankind was Jesus Christ, the Son of God, so that he could be our Savior. Next, we need to understand that that gift wasn't given to the world as a whole, but it was given to the world to individuals. That word that I mentioned, whoever. Sometimes we want the gospel just to be a sweeping thing that we, we can say, oh, 20 people got saved today. My thought is, no, we need Johnny got saved, Billy got saved, Sally got saved. We need, it's individual. You don't have your salvation through a group of people. And by the way, that's what I was mentioning this morning with worship. 
If you need someone else to stimulate you to worship God, then you're not worshiping God. If you need, if you need a certain song to play and it makes a tear come out of your eye and then you worship God, something's wrong. By the, you, as a matter of fact, if you need music in order to worship God, something is wrong. Amen. Amen. And we've got the greatest gift given to us is the Son. And the gift was given to the whole world. And the only prerequisite to receive this gift is to believe. There's the gospel right there. God loves this world. That he gave his one and only son. And all you have to do is be a whosoever that believes and you'll be saved. That's it. The simplicity of the gospel. Receive this scripture as God's word, as truth, and believe. How much clearer could the scripture be? And how much easier could it be to be saved? I mean, I haven't done an in-depth study, but I know there are religions that say you have to do specific things in order to gain your heavenly home. Some, some people, they, they have to spend time going out and evangelizing so many people for so long a time. Some religions, they, you've got to give so much money some religions, you have to kill so many infidels. <laughs> and Jesus Christ, he paid the price for us. All we have to do is believe. Amen. Now, as we get a hold of this fact, at this setting, the clearest, most concise explanation of the gospel, given by the gospel himself, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, you know, what needs to happen here? And Jesus tells them, you must be born again. All this takes place. And the gospel himself, Jesus Christ, is giving away the gospel to Nicodemus. And we see Nicodemus, what was his response to this wonderful gospel? Nothing. This scripture that we quote to everybody, and at the end of the at the end of this passage, you don't see where Nicodemus hit his knees and said, I accept Jesus. I want to live forever in heaven. You don't see it. I mean, aside from the question of how can this happen? And how can this be? We see no other response from this man to Jesus Christ. Which leads me to believe if Jesus couldn't lead someone to Christ himself, how am I supposed to? Let's look at what happened as we look on through the scripture. This happened many times that Jewish leaders wanted to put Jesus and his ministry out of business. So they sent soldiers to arrest Jesus and bring him before them so that they could question him and find something wrong so that they could discredit him. John chapter 7 is the response when those officers went to arrest Jesus. John 7, verse 45. It says, The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said to them, Why did you not bring him? The officers answered, Never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. The Pharisees then answered them, You have not also been led astray, have you? No one of the rulers or Pharisees has believed in, in him, has he? But this crowd, which does not know the law, is accursed. These soldiers come back, they, the Pharisees look at him and say, Where? We sent you, that was an easy job. We sent you out to get Jesus. It shouldn't be hard to find. Just go look for the crowd. <laughs> go find him, bring him back. Why haven't you done this? And they looked, these soldiers looked at these Pharisees and said, we haven't seen anybody, we haven't heard anyone who spoke the way he speaks. And right away, the Pharisees, you ever notice when you, when you do something right, there's always somebody that's going to start throwing stuff at you? Well, you, have you started believing this craziness too? You don't see any of us? 
following after this Jesus, and we are experts. We know the word of God. <laughs> so you're following the crowd, and those cr the crowd, look at that crowd. They're idiots. They're unschooled. They're uneducated. They, they don't even talk well. And you're following these people. Verse 50. Remember Nicodemus? Didn't respond to Jesus? Verse 50. Nicodemus, he who came to him before being one of them, said to them, Our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he is doing, does it? They answered him, You are not also from Galilee, are you? Here we have Nicodemus who no longer question, is questioning the purpose of Christ, but he's cautiously defending Jesus Christ. Our Savior before the Sanhedrin. He started taking a stand. We see here a transition beginning to take place in the life of Nicodemus. And how many of you know, sometimes when you put the seed in the ground, it's very seldom that it jumps right up. When you plant that seed, it takes a little bit of time. It takes some, some nurturing. Now, some, I remember when I was a little guy, they gave me seeds. And I decided I was going to plant me a flower garden. And I dug it up, and I got it all worked up. And then I put the seeds in, and I watered it. And then I got back, and I waited. And I waited. And I waited. I decided something was wrong with those seeds, so I dug them up to look and see what's happening. <laughs> they were still there. So I buried them back down again. And I waited. And I waited. And I kept back, and I, I uncovered them. What's going on? And there was a little bit of stuff that no seeds never, I didn't, I didn't give them an opportunity to become what they were meant to be. But we've got to understand that as we bring the word of God, Jesus brought the word of God to Nicodemus, and it wasn't something that, boom, and his life was changed. It was a seed planted that began to grow. Now let's take a look at what takes place immediately following the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. We know that the passion of the Christ, all that he went through, and he suffered and died for us. John chapter 19, verse 38. It says, after these things, Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate granted permission, so he came and took away his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen wrapping with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. As I begin looking through the life of Nicodemus, and I got to that point, and I begin asking, so what has happened here? The man who questioned Jesus, and he became the man who carefully defended Christ. That same man became the man when Peter had denied him. Jesus is, on the, is, is carrying his cross, and Peter is there in different, three different times. People said, I know you're one of his disciples. The third time, the Bible says he cursed. You might say he cursed said, I don't know the man. Leave me alone. And the rooster crowed. And Peter left. You look for the other disciples. We give, we give Peter a bad time. At least he was there. Other than John the Beloved, who was at the feet of Jesus with, the, with his mother Mary, all the rest of the disciples, they were gone. Nowhere to be found. And here, Nicodemus, when all the everyone else and fail him. Stop and think, how many people did Jesus heal during his lifetime? He reached out and touched a leprous person and caused health to come into him. He spoke to ten lepers and they all got healed. He, he healed the sick. He cast out demons. He raised the dead. And where were all these people at when Jesus is dead? He's died. He's there and need to be put in the tomb. 
None of them. But you find this fellow Nicodemus. <coughs> he took responsibility for preparing the lifeless body of Jesus Christ for birth. We're talking about one of the Pharisees. Those that made themselves enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. Because they knew if, if Jesus Christ was correct, and he was the Messiah that everyone was looking for, then their position was going to be one that was going to be lost. Everything was going to change. And those Pharisees wanted nothing to do with Jesus Christ. And here we have one of the Pharisees who went to Jesus secretly, who, who did not respond to the salvation message, ended up standing up carefully for Jesus before the Sanhedrin. Now he is coming taking responsibility to prepare his lifeless body for the grave. So what does all this mean? Does it mean that salvation is a process? Was this man ever really <laughs> saved? And my question was, Lord, when did it happen? When did he get saved? See, the Spirit of God was in Christ. God through Christ was reaching out to Nicodemus this whole time. Preparing him for what the Old Testament people were looking for the Messiah. We're living in a day and age where people are looking for the Messiah. Oh, you ask them and they say, no, not me. I don't believe in that stuff. But really deep down inside, they know there's more than this. You ask the average person, have we been able to be out on the square today? You ask the average person walking down the street, are you going to heaven? Most of them, even those that proclaim there is no heaven, most of them will say, yes, I'm going to heaven. There will even be some of them saying, no, I've, I've, I've talked to people that said, no, nah, we're going to party in hell. Sadly, that's true, but it's not the kind of party that anyone's ever known. You see, deep down in each person, God has given each one of us a spirit that desires life. That desires There's so many people. They're, they're working to, to build something that they can leave behind in their hands. Something that will trans... Uh, words not to that go beyond their own life. And when they're dead and gone, people will remember them. They want to be eternal. God had been preparing Nicodemus and worked through him. But even in a greater way today, because Jesus said, when I go, I will send the comfort of the Holy Spirit to be with you. And today, the Holy Spirit is moving like never before in this world. And he desires to work in and through each one of us to make sure that loss John chapter 3, verse 5. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. And when a child is born, once that child comes forth from its mother, and once that child takes that breath, it is 
not meant to go back into the mother's womb. It is not meant to go back to where it came from. But to go forth and have life and live and be all that it was created to be. And in the same manner, when we believe, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, listen to me this morning. This is what keeps us from fulfilling what God has for us. This is what keeps us from sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because after we are born and come forth, so often we want to go back to where we came from. And that is sick. That is wrong. That is contrary to God's plan. God wants us to come forth. He wants us to be alive. He wants us to live with Jesus Christ. Old things need to pass away. The way we used to think has got to be gone. A new thought process. And we have to live in that. We cannot revert back. Romans chapter 8, verse 12. So then, brethren, we are under obligation. Listen to me this morning. Not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you must die. But if you live, but if you live by the Spirit, you are putting to death the deeds of the body, and you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the signs. For you have not received a spirit of slavery, leading to fear again. You've not been delivered from that so that it can have a hold of you and pull you back in. But you have received a spirit of adoption. As sons by which we cry out, Daddy God, Abba, Father. I want you to know this morning, salvation is not a process. The process is in our ability to listen and to submit to God the Holy Spirit. That means letting go of doubt. Stop letting shortcomings sin. And our flesh dictate our response to the Spirit of God. The Old Testament prophet said, as he was hiding from Jezebel, in that cave, there was a wind that blew and split rocks. There was a fire that came and burned everything. There was an earthquake that caused the ground to rock. But in all those, he did not hear the voice of God. But then he listened and he heard the still, small voice of God. And for us, to listen to the still, small voice of God, to recognize that voice, this world is loud. God is still and small because he doesn't want that relationship that is everyone and everything. He wants that relationship that is you and he. And he wants that relationship to be so much that you will pour yourself into others and they will find that relationship. This morning, how is your relationship with Jesus Christ? Is your relationship with Jesus Christ one that should be copied by others? Would you be like Paul who said, follow me? Or would 
would you be like, and I hear it all the time from radio preachers, don't follow me. Follow Jesus. I'm not perfect. I'm just forgiven. Let me tell you something. They see Jesus in you. They see Jesus in you. And yeah, we're not perfect, but we have the perfect one in us. And if the same spirit that raised him from the dead dwells in us, he will quicken our mortal body. What is your response today? The Holy Spirit is speaking to you. He's either testifying that you're a child of God, or he's speaking to your spirit that you must be born again. The real question today is, what's your response? Wednesday night, for quite a while, we did a series on the miraculous. And I've come to the conclusion that the greatest miracle that's ever taken place in my life is when Jesus Christ washed my sins. Amen. Yeah. And he gave me the life that I could only dream of. My question to you today is, you living the dream? Are you living the dream? Are you living the life? Sure, there are struggles. There are times in my life where I go through things and I, I pray, oh Lord, don't let anybody follow me here. How did I get here? How did I get out? Because I know all of us would do good just to touch the hem of his garment this morning. But I'd like everyone across this congregation to come and find a place to kneel and to pray and to touch the Master today. Would you stand with me this morning? 
Father, as we prepare to come, Lord, let your sweet spirit pour through this place. Break any bondage. Anything that would hold us back. Lord, today, I've been asking that this morning we would experience the miraculous. Lord, I'm going to ask you to define what miraculous is for each one. I pray that each one in this place today would experience your miraculous. In Jesus' name. Would you just come and find a place around the altar? Take some time, as much time as you want, to touch the hand of God. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Holy, 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 holy. Thank you for the saving, washing, renewing blood of Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 holy, 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 hallelujah, 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 thank you, Father, thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, the life, the life that only comes from you, hallelujah. Hallelujah, that life Living it to its best. Living the dream, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Father, we receive today life and life more abundant. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Father, Lord. We receive your touch, your renewing. Lord, the regenerating power that comes only from you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for the assurance that Jesus is mine and I belong to him. And Lord, 
today is nothing like what I had planned. But I thank you that your plans supersede. And Father, right now, in Jesus' name, not only do we surrender this service to you, but we surrender all of our days to you. And I pray the miraculous has begun here this morning. The washing, the healing, the comfort. Lord, I pray not only that it would continue, but that it would become a washing, a renewing, a releasing and a comfort that we deliver to this world. Now, Father, I speak a blessing upon each one under the sound of my voice. That we would determine to live lives of soul winners. Lord, that we would go beyond saying what we believe and we would begin doing what we believe. We would begin living what we believe. I speak a blessing <clears throat> 40, 60, 100 fold that each one of us would demonstrate your love in such ways that people will recognize their need for our Savior, Jesus Christ. I speak the blessing of laying up rewards in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy. I speak the blessing of living a life that is the dream, the will of God. Lord, I speak the blessing that comes from you, and I speak it in each life today. And I thank you, Father, in the precious wonderful name of Jesus. And everyone who received that said, Amen. 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 Live the life that God dreamed for you. Be what he's called you to be. And let his blessings flow through. I want to just tell you, have a blessed and wonderful day. And I want to encourage you important part in the body of Christ is our captain's tables. That's where we, we build those relationships and we learn how to care for one another. And what the needs of one another are. When you come in the doors on Sunday morning, we have a good service and you leave. People in the church and the body of Christ don't know how to lift you up unless they've spent some time with you. And we're revamping Captain's Table to be that coming together, that fellowship, that camaraderie, that unity, that encouragement, that help. And as far as for a prayer chain, that's what Captain's Tables are about. If you're in the Captain's Table and you have a need, you let them know. It goes through their table. They call the leader of another Captain's Table. It goes through their table. And that's how we do things. I'd encourage you to get involved. We made an effort to put it together. Dennis and Lee are having theirs at 6, Dennis. They're home. Nancy, we're at Brown's house at 5. And if you were part of Tim and Brenda's group or haven't been to a captain's table, I'm going to be here at 6, and we're going to be having a captain's table. I'll tell you what, it's much better than watching a ball game. Oh. <laughs>